We join one another today on the land and near the rivers, originally in the care and protection of the Adena and Hopal nations and the Monongahela peoples and shared over time by many indigenous nations, including the Delaware, Iroquois and Shawnee tribes as a place of gathering and exchange. We join you also on the land and near the rivers cared for and cultivated as a site of freedom from the Underground Railroad to global uprisings for racial justice. As a process of rematriation, we acknowledge our connection to place and honor the land as a relative. This is a Department of Teaching, Learning and Leading's rematriation statement led by Dr. Sabina Bach. Good morning and welcome to the Latinx Conference and to our fourth featured event which is also part of the Year of Data and Society Initiative at the University of Pittsburgh. Today's panel is Latinx Data, Historical Civil Rights Advocacy and Contemporary Intersectional Insights. I'm Lisa Ortiz and my pronouns are she, her, ella. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning and Leading in the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us today on this Friday morning. We kicked off our Latinx Connect conference yesterday with great success and encourage you to check out the rest of their program. We'll drop the link in the chat here soon. I also want to thank our sponsor, the Year of Data and Society, which provides an opportunity to think critically about the data we collect, use, and leave behind as traces through our scholarly work, education, institutional operations, and digital lives. For more information about the Year of Data and Society, you can visit their website uh, in the link that will be dropped in the chat. Thank you also to everyone who has offered logistical and technical support for this event and the conference overall, and to our excellent leaders, Dr. Gina Garcia from the School of Education and Ron Idoko from the Office of Equity, Diversity, and inclusion. We have two incredible presentations lined up and invite you to share on social media through at Latinx Connect, at Pit Data Society, and hashtag Latinx Connect. We will first hear from Dr. Michael Rodriguez Muniz, followed by Dr. Amalia Zidache. We will then take questions from the audience, but feel free to submit questions or comments in the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Rodriguez Muniz, who was born and raised on Chicago's Northwest side. Dr. Rodriguez Muniz is an assistant professor of sociology and Latina Latino studies at Northwestern University. He is the author of Figures of the Future, Latino Civil Rights and the Politics of Demographic Change, published by Princeton University Press in 2021. He has published in several journals and edited volumes on the topics of Latinx identity and advocacy and the politics of racial knowledge. Currently, Dr. Rodriguez Muniz is studying the afterlives of political repression against anti-colonial Puerto Rican activists in Chicago. The title of his talk today is Desire for Data, Population Politics and the Making of National Latino Civil Rights Advocacy. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Lisa. Let me just set up this uh, PowerPoint and we'll get started. So good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to be part of this inaugural Latinx, uh, Latinx Connect conference uh, supported by Pitt's Year of Data and Society. Many thanks to Drs. Lisa Ortiz and Gina Garcia for the invitation to share some of my work and for the opportunity to do so alongside Dr. Amalia Dache. Um, looking forward to our conversation and hopefully ongoing dialogue on issues important to Latinx uh, peoples in this country. 
Over the past four or five decades, there's been an explosion of statistical data on the Hispanic, Latino, Latina, and Latinx population. We routinely consume this knowledge, whether from newspaper articles, lectures, public service announcements, reports, and political speeches. Uh, this diet is in, impactful. Uh, this data helps, these data help to inform, some might say disform, uh, how this population is seen and seemingly understood. It influences self-identification, senses of community. It enables and constrains diagnoses of the present and of the present and visions about the future. Uh, despite this, scholars have only recently begun to study the production and circulation of such knowledge. Traditionally and still principally, academic researchers have used statistical data on Latinx populations as a source for analysis rather than as an object of study in its own right. For this reason, we still have a lot to learn and understand about the historical origins, political conditions, and social effects uh, of Latinx data. What choices mark and stratify the making of Latinx data? What agendas and assumption, assumptions animate this process? Uh, how have statistical figures on the Latinx population been publicly mobilized and made meaningful? What is the relationship between contemporary representations of Latinidad and its statisticalization? In my new book, um, I set out to contribute to these current conversations about Latinx data and ethno-racial demographic change. It's titled Figures of the Future because I tell the story of two kinds of figures that aspire towards the future. The first set of figures are national Latino civil rights leaders and organizations. I'm speaking about groups like Unidos US, formerly the National Council of La Raza, the League of United Latin American Citizens, a Voto Latino, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, as well as the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, a coalition of some of the major uh, national uh, groups. These organizations uh, form an advocacy network uh, that's organized and oriented uh, around the Latino population and purportedly its um, empowerment. The second set of figures I discuss in the book are demographic figures about the Latino Latinx population, figures such as those produced in the last decennial census. Now there's a close relationship between these two sets of figures. Demographic numbers are ever present in the public facing statements and reports of Latino advocacy organizations, routinely, almost ritualistically facts and figures uh, about the present and projected size of the Latino population um, saturate uh, all major aspects of their efforts, public relations, voter operations, and legislative campaigns. In my book, I focus on how Latino civil rights advocates have wielded demographic numbers and narratives to affect political change. In other words, how they've engaged in what I call in the book population politics. In short, population politics refers to struggles waged to influence how demography, demographic populations, demographic trends are perceived and understood. Historically, such struggles have profoundly shaped what demographic categories, processes, and futures are considered or understood as deserving of attention and what valences they are ascribed. However, today I'm less concerned with contem the contemporary population politics of mainstream Latino civil rights groups and more interested in exploring with you the question of how population politics became central to this political project in the first place. The answer to this question, I believe, demands that we return to the linked genesis of both Latinx data and national Latino civil rights advocacy. Now, I don't have time to, to fully dwell on this timeline, which is a work in progress. Um, it's something that I, I developed trying to th think through um, you know, today's conversation. Um, but there's a couple of things here to consider. Uh, one, the origins of Latinx data, or we might consider Latinx data, uh, being in colonial projects, um, shifting racial logics of classification across uh, a number of decades and centuries, the transformation of modes of collection from enumerators to self-reported or self-identification, uh, and the role of advocacy and political pressure throughout the process. Um, and I should note that this timeline um, it focuses on censuses and state knowledge, uh, 
which is only sort of a fraction or a part of sort of broader discussions about Latinx data, but centrally, you know, uh, the census and the like have been important parts um, of that story. And we could certainly return to some of these episodes um, in, in the Q&A and if there's some points of conversation. Um, but today, uh, I'd like to spend time focusing on, on a particular period, um, which is during the civil rights era. And it's during this period that both national Latino advocacy and genuinely pan-ethnic Latino data was developed. Um, and so I'll be concentrating on that. And again, um, certain, happy to talk about um, some of the shifts and changes uh, over time. So as I mentioned, demographic numbers and narratives saturate contemporary national Latino advocacy. Um, and that might not seem very curious, and perhaps we should expect that. Um, but it's worth recalling that this was not always the case. Uh, when LULAC was founded, for instance, in the late 1920s, demographic knowledge and statistics was not a major sort of object of concern or a rhetorical tool. Uh, neither was it for the farm workers movement decades later or even much of the Chicano movement. Um, groups like the Young Lords uh, did not emphasize and articulate themselves via demographic statistics, for instance, to a great extent. Um, however, demographic data did become important for the kind of first generation of, of uh, Mexican-American, Puerto Rican, and later on Cuban-American advocates that became kind of the founders of national Latino advocacy in and around uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and statistics, I argue, became important because they were seen, uh, they came to be seen as a, as a solution to the problem of invisibility, which is widely sort of understood as, as a chief obstacle for um, empowerment, advancement, or dealing with uh, disparities and inequities um, during that period. So the Mexican-American predecessors of today's national Latino advocacy organizations were frustrated with the invisibility of Mexican-Americans in policymaking and public discourse. They felt ignored and absent from the national conversation Politicians and journalists, they asserted, only saw them as a, as a kind of marginal, local, regional population uh, or issue. Um, and they believed and argued that this condition, this kind of notion that they were kind of insignificant to the national story, um, were, was a condition that hindered their ability to call attention to the social, economic, and political needs of the population. These, and these pronouncements and these arguments didn't go unheard. In 1966, the country's leading uh, teaching, teachers union uh, elected to title its report uh, in support of bilingual education, the invisible minority. You can see uh, the cover of it uh, on the slide. Um, in 1968, the US Commission on Civil Rights um, released a, a, a paper uh, on Mexican Americans um, that expressed a similar sentiment. It claimed that, quote, the lack of Anglo understanding and of attention to the social conditions of Mexican Americans has been extensive, not only at the national level where it's virtually complete, but also in the Southwest itself. Now, this ignorance, the paper argued, was related to a, quote, astonishing lack of hard data on this population. Journalist Helen Rowan, who authored the commission's report, uh, wrote a condensed uh, version of, of the report for the Atlantic Monthly, pointedly titled it, A Minority No One Knows. Within this context, uh, Julian Zamora, a young Mexican-American sociologist at the University of uh, at Notre Dame, elected to name uh, his 1966 edited volume, La Raza, Forgotten Americans. Zamora was one of the co-founders of the National Council of La Raza, and he emphasized the need for more research on Mexican Americans. As you can see in the quote, he says in the conclusion to the book, not many scholars have concerned themselves with Spanish-speaking people. During the last 25 years, only a few books have been written on them, and most of them have been on specialized topics. It's no surprise that the professionals in private and public agencies have limited knowledge and understanding of these people whom they would serve. In these and other works published at the time, the apparent visibility of, quote, the Spanish-speaking people was framed to a large extent as a problem of a lack of knowledge 
and specifically an absence of statistical knowledge. Now this turn to statistics and this sort of view of statistics didn't happen uh, in a political vacuum. It happened as ethnic and racial statistics were beginning to undergo, undergo a dramatic transformation. Up until this period, racial statistics have been wielded almost without exception as instruments of racial domination, determining, for instance, who was and was not eligible to be a U.S. citizen. But challenges to implementing civil rights legislation, particularly the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, led to new uses and new values for ethno-racial statistics. It's within this context that Latino advocates, or who became to, to be understood as Latino advocates, began to make public demands for data, uh, which they uh, argued was a civil right. This was most clearly, this position was most clearly and extensively elaborated in a 1974 report produced by the National Council of La Raza. Uh, in the preface uh, to the report, the organization's acting director, Alex Emano, as you can see uh, on the slide, said uh, or wrote, for too long, the Hispanic American has been buried in the anonymity of statistics and semantics that neither apply to them nor characterize them. The absence of information on this population, the report claimed, was in essence a violation of their civil rights. The author of the report, uh, Roberto Olivas, a Los Angeles-born uh, World War II veteran, stressed that the problem was not merely categorical or terminological. Rather, it was a failure of the entire information system. Olivas claimed, quote, the public has the right to quality information. Public institutions have an obligation to provide sound information, not misinformation, useful information, not statistical atrocities. Olivas, via, via the report, accused the federal government of having a biracial, that is black, white, information infrastructure that characterized and underrepresented what the report described as the country's uh, multi-ethnic and multicultural population. Now, NCLR's report made clear that the decennial census was only one part of a much broader informatics issue. However, they and other organizations saw the Census Bureau and how it categorized Mexican Americans and other, quote, Spanish-speaking groups as a vital starting point. To cease being invisible, they argued, uh, they began to make demands to become legible uh, in the decennial census. In 1968, as the Census Bureau prepared for the 1970 decennial census, the U.S. Interagency Committee on Mexican Americans, uh, which was established by President Johnson, issued a recommendation regarding the inclusion of a question to count Mexican Americans. The Census Bureau resisted the recommendation, claiming that it had already printed out the forms. Still, pressure from the, new the Nixon administration resulted in the addition of a question on Spanish heritage uh, on the long form which was distributed at the time to a sample of the national population. About 5% of the U.S. population was asked this question that you can see on the slide in the 1970 uh, census. Prior to this, ever since the controversy over the 1930 census and its inclusion, one-time inclusion of a Mexican race category, the Census Bureau had relied on a series of measures such as birthplace, surname, and language. Advocates charged that these so-called objective measures failed to adequately count Mexican Americans and other Latin American descent groups. They argued that these measures uh, resulted in a large undercount. In addi the addition of this Spanish heritage question in the 1970 uh, census, or at least the, the sort of the long form census, um, did not quell qu conflict around the census. Led primarily by Mexican American groups, lawsuits would be filed against the Census Bureau as were reports published critical of this data. These critiques would be powerfully validated to the displeasure of census officials in the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights 1974 report titled Counting the Forgotten. The report charged that the Census Bureau's procedures uh, have been insensitive to Spanish-speaking background population. It identified several problems, including no uniform measure of population, inadequate assistance for Spanish-speaking households, and insufficient bilingual enumerators. What followed was an intense struggle to include a question or a category of the Spanish-speaking population in the next census. Uh, 
The category Hispanic emerged from these struggles. National Latino civil rights, as the sociologist Cristina Mora shows, played an important role in these efforts. Notably, Mexican and Puerto Rican and Cuban advocates had not initially called for an encompassing term, nor was it even obvious to the parties involved that they should be lumped together. The willingness of early civil rights leaders to come together under a shared categorical umbrella was not, a straight, was not straightforward or preordained. And neither was the decision to define Hispanic as a, sp a special ethnic category. Research suggests that this definition had less to do with the nature of the groups in question and more to do with placating competing political and methodological interests. Given that much of the Spanish-speaking population had been traditionally counted as white, census officials were concerned that making it a racial category would make it difficult to compare census data over time. They were also worried that the impact of such a designation would have on the counts of other racialized quote unquote minorities. At the time, when groups were politicizing census undercounts, the prospects of lower numbers of African American, Native American, and Asian American populations was a situation that the Census Bureau sought to avoid. For them and other actors, an ethnic definition of Hispanic and a two-question data collection format it necessitated came to be seen as the best method to render Latin American descent peoples statistically legible with the least amount of institutional change and political commotion. Uh, within this, it's important to note that Latino civil rights advocates at the time challenged uh, the U.S. government's longstanding practice of racially classifying and counting the majority of this population as white. They contended that in practice they were generally not treated as such. Their calls for Hispanic data was by and large a call for a defection from statistical whiteness. Being grouped and lumped with whites essentially erased, erased the violence, exploitation, and impoverishment lived by most members of this population, one exception being uh, the first wave of Cuban refugees. Offering testimony at public hearings, lobbying in Congress, and arguing with census officials, advocates helped spur the passage of Public Law 94-311, uh, uh, titled Americans of Spanish Origin Social, St Social Statistics in 1976. As one scholar noted, it, quote, remains uh, the only law in the country's history that mandates the collection, analysis, and publication of data for a specific ethnic group. These advocates were also instrumental in the adoption of the category Hispanic in the 1980 census. Now this push for statistical data uh, among these advocates initially was for the purposes of documenting ethnic and racial discrimination and socioeconomic disparities. Uh, but by the second half of the 1970s, so you know, a few years before the category Hispanic was introduced in the census, this data began to be increasingly used by advocates to give further heft to their arguments and claims for political recognition. This knowledge offered a novel type of ammunition, ammunition they would grow accustomed to using. Demographic data and argumentation was increasingly seen as politically potent and indispensable. None of this is to suggest that advocates had not previously made use of demographic knowledge. For some time, advocates had described Mexican Americans and the Sp Spanish speaking population as the second largest minority. But such claims grew in frequency over this decade. More important, there was a change in how such claims were made. Earlier demographic changes, claims tended to be more informational and descriptive. As time passed, they became more rhetorical and projective. Hence, here is when population politics came into the picture. This shift is visible in NCLR's magazine, Agenda. Uh, at its peak, it had a circulation of nearly 30,000. Excuse me. Um, uh, one point in example can be found in its uh, January, February 1980 issue. Uh, dedicated to the topic of Latino political uh, progress and power, it was published on the eve of the first census. On its third page, a short section titled Looking Ahead was encased in a, a graphical rendering of the sun. Its first paragraph read, a new decade is beginning, one which has been called the Hispanic decade or our decade in the sun. <laughs> 
predictions uh, of rapid increase in numbers and uh, excuse me and the power accompanies numerical strength and given reason for optimism and expectation among Hispanics will the optimism be warranted will the expectations be fulfilled will numbers after all make such a difference these weighty questions were not posed rhetorically the editorial statement quickly resolved any uncertainty about the relationship between demography and progress instructing readers that the remainder of the issue would explore quote some of the ways that hispanic numbers can make uh, make the difference in unity and politics and hemispheric relations 40 years later advocates remain convinced that demographic numbers documented statistically can and will make a positive difference But as we know from the work of Elena Gutierrez and Leo Chavez, the emergence of Latino demographics as an object of public discourse and politics coincided with and was linked to discourses against undocumented immigration from Mexico and Latin America, as well as uh, sort of Latin American populations more generally. Thus, as Latino civil rights advocates were beginning to mobilize demographic statistics and futures to advance their agendas, um, this demographic would be cast as a threat to the racial, economic, cultural, and linguistic integrity of the country, a development, as we can still see today, that is with us four decades later. So why return to this history? Uh, for starters, it provides us with a way of making sense of how population politics became intertwined with Latino civil rights advocacy. In struggles over and for data, yesterday's advocates developed a desire for demographic data and became tactically equipped with narratives about Latino and Hispanic futures, often calibrated against the more dominant dystopic renderings in circulation. Uh, it also gives us some insight into some of the, the legacies that are still with us. For instance, the category Hispanic uh, and, and subsequent sort of adoption of Latino in, in everyday sort of language, which was not in wide currency prior to this period. Uh, in addition, uh, the widely stated, even up to today, that Hispanic or Latino or ethnic as opposed to racial categories um, comes from the political negotiations and struggles of this um, period. Um, and the focus, uh, in addition, the focus on demographic data is also important. Uh, if, if there's a meta-narrative about the Latinx Latino population, at least for the last several decades, um, it's been about its demographic vitality. Think about how frequently um, the size and growth rate of the Latino population is invoked in conversations about contemporary electoral politics, economics, the impact of changes to racial identification, the size of, of Latinx students on campuses, and the like. Further consider how assumptions about demographic trends and populations, um, most centrally the Latino population, powers rhetoric about the so-called browning of America, the sleeping giant, um, white nationalist discourses about white replacement, uh, phrases like majority minority. Um, so to a large extent, uh, it's population politics that has uh, fueled the production and valorization of Latinx statistical data. Uh, through numbers and narratives, the Latinx population has been constructed and positioned at the epicenter of debates about ethno-racial demographic change. Um, and this is not, as we know, an abstract issue. Demographic and imaginaries fueled by population politics profoundly influence contemporary politics and policy making. Um, and we don't need to look far. Uh, current rhetoric about voter fraud, illegal immigration, redistricting, um, shows this population politics particularly among conservatives has made such issues demographic issues um, and of course we can't take afford to take racialized population politics for granted uh, it can and, and at times has been a matter of life and death um, we can recall just two years ago a white supremacist killed 23 in el paso claiming a quote hispanic invasion this horrific act is only one in a long history of population politics fueled violence um, against uh, this population and other populations in the US context. So our attention uh, is, must be on these actors and the communicative channels through which uh, 
uh, something like white demographic fear is stoked. But at the same time, we must also create space to understand how those from minoritized groups have also engaged in population politics, produced data um, as a means to address longstanding uh, exclusions and in attempts, however limited, in building political power. As we can see through the case of Latino civil rights agendas, a population politics uh, need not be conducted in the service of population control or what scholars have called demographic engineering. Historically, that's been the major role and ramifications of demographic discourse. But at least since the civil rights period, population politics have been used to make racial equity gains. These engagements deserve our attention as well. To conclude, analyses of the population of, of the politics of Latinx data can help us better track and understand, as well as contest the features and fissures that mark Latinidad. But to do so, we must disabuse ourselves of the notion that data speaks for itself. We must instead ask ourselves how and with what consequences we have made uh, data speak. This shift allows us to ask a series of more difficult but necessary questions. Do our modes of making demographic data, among other forms of data, grow our sense of justice? Do they validate different experiences and histories? Do they make possible addressing historical validations, uh, historical violations and present inequalities? Whom do they entitle to imagine and exist in the present and the future and those uh, who are, who does it prevent um, from existing and being imagined as part of the present and the future. Uh, on that note, thank you very much for your indulgence and your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez Muñiz. As a reminder to audience members, we will engage with questions at the ends of both presentations, but feel free to submit any questions you might have now via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and or share reactions in the chat. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amalia Z. Dache. An Afro-Cuban American scholar, Dr. Amalia Dache is an associate professor in the higher education division at the University of Pennsylvania. Her experiences as a Cuban refugee and student traversing US educational systems inform her research and professional activities. Dr. Dacha's major research areas are post-colonial geographic context of higher education, Afro-Latina, Afro-Latino, Afro-Latinx studies, community and student resistance and the college access experiences of African diasporic students and communities. She is lead editor of Rise Up, Activism as Education, published in 2019 by Michigan State University Press. Her talk, the title of her talk today is Cartographies of Afro-Latinidad, Limits and Possibilities. Welcome, Amalia. Good morning, everyone. So I just want to make sure you can see my slides. Okay, so, so good morning, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here at the University of Pittsburgh's Latinx Connect Conference. And so also grateful to Dr. Ortiz and Garcia for inviting me and also being a panelist um, along Dr. Muñiz. And so I am going to be sharing today some of the work I've done in Philadelphia and outside of Philadelphia, um, including the Cuban population on Afro-Latinidad and demographics, and of course, looking at some mapping. So what are the limits and possibilities of publicly available data for Afro-Latinx populations? The primary source, as we saw um, with Dr. Muñiz's talk is uh, the census when we look at uh, race and ethnic variables. And so we also know that for uh, populations in the United States, like Afro-Latinos, Afro-Latinx, in order to uh, actually gain knowledge based on measures, you have to look at the Hispanic variable and then also look at the Black variable. Other surveys like the Pew Research Center 2014 Latino survey uh, is uh, draws from 1500 respondents 
And that survey has also been used to draw kind of public information on Afro-Latinidad. As to Afro-Latin American data sets, TELES, uh, PERLA project is commonly used. But in order to understand educational access, which is my field, and how Afro-Latinos build knowledge communities, I use geographic tools uh, with the census data um, to learn about cities and learn about how populations live, how they engage their social environments, um, what are the institutions and resources in proximity. However, before going into the data, it's important to gather some context on how Blackness is understood within the diaspora. So the diaspora in the Americas and also those that remained on the continent have unique local, national, and hemispheric experiences of domination and resistance. Similar to exponential functions in mathematics, there are numerous ways humans with darker skin experience negritude. Blackness. Historically, as to the roots of this racial construct, how has being Negro, Black, been defined within the Western Hemisphere? In Alejandro de la Fuente and Ariala Gorosa's most recent text, Becoming Free, Becoming Black, they mark 1522 as the date in the Americas when the first slave code and term Negro appears in the municipal order. It appears in the first colonial slave society in the hemisphere, Santo Domingo. It was called La Ordenanza de los Negros. Although 1619, the project we're all very familiar with from the New York Times, marks the first year that uh, enslaved Africans were brought to the British colony of Virginia, 1619, the institution of slavery and association of blackness and bondage was not tightly coupled at this time. Thus, African Americans in early colonial Virginia had an ambiguous legal status that was unthinkable in the Spanish colonial world. The first British colony to develop a slave, a slave code, Barbados, did so in 1661, decades after the first slaves had set foot in Virginia. The first direct reference to Negros or Negroes as slaves in uh, Virginia legislation appeared in 1659. So we know Blackness is divisible based on geographic context, and we know its definition, it's related to enslavement and as it was situated within the Spanish speaking Caribbean. Yet, yeah, how do we understand this Black presence numerically as to the data in the Americas and how we quantify this group in the US? So well over 90% of enslaved people, African people, were brought to the Caribbean in South America. And only 6% of African enslaved Africans were sent directly to British North America. This is of quantitative importance because of the amount of the diaspora that resides in the south of the hemisphere. So when sharing these percentages with students, they are typically quite surprised at the amount of African people living outside of the US. It reminds me of the Mercator projection map. Do you remember that map? It was, it was established and created in 1569 that showed that Africa was quite small and the Americas quite small in comparison to Europe, Greenland, and Russia. So in essence, I feel like the imagination of many uh, US students and US people broadly, they have a consumption of blackness that in their mind, the United States would be this kind of uh, bigger image and bigger concentration of, of Black people when the reality is, based on what we know historically, is that 90% of people of African descent do reside outside of the U.S. <laughs> 
So layering the quantification of these racial ethnic, ethnic groups across transnational, national, municipal levels, there would be a need to contextualize immigrant and home country experiences and history, while also understanding the scale of racialization and race making as it shifts each degree uh, with the migration context. So when moving to the national scale, how do Afro-Latinos categorize themselves based on the 2014 Pew Research Report? And so we see here that a quarter of US Hispanics identify as Afro-Latino, 24%. And we see here to the left that out of those 24%, 24% of the, of the sample identifies as Afro-Latino, and out of this percent, only 18% choose Black as part of a single race or multiple race answer. White was chosen, white was chosen at 39%, again, as a single or multiple race answer. So what are some of the theories related to why it is that Afro-Latinos um, check the Black box less than they do the white box when they're filling out the survey? One of the first theories is something that we're familiar with in the literature related to this distancing from blackness and this distancing from Africanness um, that happens because of histories of whitening in the Latin American and the Caribbean and Latin America. And we also know that, um, that this is also present in the United States, this pushing to, to whiteness um, as, as you gain status. Another theory that responds to why it is that Afro-Latinos would check the black box less is that there is uh, cultural variations in how Afro-Latinos see blackness or Africanness that they see as specific to their language and national heritage. And they see black as more representative of US African-Americanness. And so that is also a factor in why they would check the box less. But what's really important is that geography plays a role also in how Latinos identify uh, and especially Afro-Latinos. So for example, in the work that I've been doing on Cuban refugees, I interviewed uh, a participant that was living in Miami and had seen himself as a first Cuban. And then when he moved out of Miami and moved north to New Jersey, he had saw himself as Latino, a brown Latino. And I thought that was interesting because it seems as if he turned brown once he went north. And so it's important to understand that the political context and demographic context of the area uh, and the history of these regions in the United States do also influence how Latinos identify when it comes to checking either the black box or checking the Hispanic, Hispanic box and then checking the white box less. We also know from the study related to geography that US Latinos uh, have Caribbean roots, US Latinos with Caribbean roots tend to identify as Afro-Latino um, at a higher percentage. So drawing from the 2018 US census, we see that Afro-Latinos, again, the Hispanic residents of the United States that have checked the both Hispanic and the black box are about a million six hundred and forty uh, within the US and then we know in Pennsylvania which is where I'm situated um, it's 67,000 and then in Philadelphia it's about 20,000. So interestingly we will see in a few slides um, which Latinos are included and which aren't uh, when it comes to thinking about Afro-Latinidad and I'll talk a little bit about that in relation to Brazil in a bit, in a bit, in a minute. So here, using frequency counts, you can see that there are more numerical as far as the actual numbers of Afro-Latinos situated within cities across the US. 
So it's a very urban centric population. So we have here the Seattle area, they're highly concentrated. They're highly concentrated in cities across California, in Arizona, Tucson, and Phoenix. We have here Houston, uh, of course, Florida. In Georgia, they're concentrated not in coastal cities, but actually um, within the center of the state in Atlanta, but it has high population density. So that's one of the trends that they tend to follow. And then of course we have here in the Northeast, a concentration of Northeast cities that have um, highest concentrations of Afro-Latinos. What's interesting about this map and why it's different than, for example, if you would look at a Latinx map that just looks at Latinos across the United States and not look at their uh, racial ethnic categorization. With the Latinos, you will see that they're highly concentrated in the Southeast, uh, the Southwest and the Northeast. Uh, and you wouldn't see these pockets of concentration in cities like you see in the Afro-Latino population. And then if you were to look at just the black population across the United States, you would see them concentrated again in the Northeast, which is overlaps all categories um, of Afro-Latinidad. But what you don't see in the Afro-Latinx population is that with African-Americans, they they're highly concentrated in the South. So that is two different um, ways to under, two different ways to understand the differences between Afro Latinidad kind of mapping um, demography and Latinx and African American demography. So in looking at this uh, context, as far as looking at the Afro Latin American context. We also see that, um, again, not only were the our highest concentrations of Afro Latin Latin American people in South America and the Caribbean, but when we're looking across the countries, there are some limits to understanding these data. For example, when we look at Cuba, it says here is about three three million, close to four million Cubans based off the Perla study, but. What we've learned, those of us studying Cuba and especially studying Afro-Cubans in Cuba and how Cuba um, uses its census data and actually collects data uh, based on race is that the Cuban government tends to whiten the mulatto population. And so in whitening the mulatto population, you're actually undercounting the black population. And so some of the arguments to why the Cuban government would do this is has to do with um, the leadership of the of the government being predominantly white, and then wanting then wanting to align the population with the actual leadership, and so the Cuban population is actually black population is actually double this number here, so it's closer to about eight million and not necessarily four million. So this is some of the limits of understanding these kind of broad survey data that are based on government uh, reporting. So we've talked a bit about some of the limits with the survey data and with census data, as far as thinking about context. So what are some of the possibilities? So now I wanna talk about um, looking at like the municipal scale and looking at another version of the US census Hispanic black population, looking at percentages rather than frequencies. So here, what we see is that when you look at how many of the Hispanic uh, population are black, as far as percentages, we can see that they are highly concentrated on the east of the country. Again, very different when looking at um, just the Latinx and African American population. And in the Northeast, we have Pennsylvania, which when you look at Pennsylvania and you look at the frequency, which means you know, 6,500 or more Afro uh, uh, Black Hispanic people um, within, the, within, their, um, within these counties are, are present closest to the most populated city in, in Pennsylvania, which is Philadelphia, we see that there is higher uh, concentrations of um, Afro-Latinx people here in Philadelphia and of course within the region, 
And when we look at it, look at the points, which are the college points, we'll see that there's higher concentrations of private colleges, colleges and broadly within cities, but we do know that within the Philadelphia region, most of the colleges within proximity are more private, although there's public options. So here we have the Philadelphia map, and here we have different college points. Um, I broke them down as far as nonprofit and for-profit colleges. Uh, we also have this area here uh, when we're looking at, um, it's like a triangular square area. This is the area that I concentrated on for my research study on public housing in Philadelphia and college access. And if you look at this line, it says Market Street, the reason I've put that line there is because above Market Street is considered North Philadelphia. And so that is a really important when thinking about the uh, public housing community that I'm studying because it tends to be in, it's in the area that has the highest concentrations of Latinx people, which in Philadelphia is the Puerto Rican population. So in this area is the area that has the highest concentration of Puerto Ricans and Latinx people in Philadelphia. And it's also where the housing developments are situated. Um, within this area, you can see there's in closest proximity as far as nonprofit colleges, we have Aspira City College in Esperanza, which when you think about um, the kinds of college access resources that they, they offer the Puerto Rican Latinx population in North Philly, is that a lot of their uh, marketing, a lot of their resources and outreach are in Spanish and um, have Spanish language translations, which is really important for this population, um, which is quite different to the other colleges and universities outside of the closest area to this population. Uh, and then now looking at the clustering. Um, so my research team and I have decided to use unsupervised clustering, which means that when you look at the concentrations of Hispanic, Black, and Puerto Rican, um, and Hispanic, Black, or Puerto Rican, or neither Hispanic or Black, Hispanic, Black, or Puerto Rican, you can see that there's different patterns across Philadelphia. So one of the key pieces in looking at the rest of the, the next the following maps is that looking at the Hispanic and Hispanic, Black and Puerto Rican population, they're highly concentrated in the North. And when they're concentrated in the North, there is a flow and so connection between the concentrations. Um, we also see that there's only three categories here, Hispanic, Black and, Hispanic, Black or, and then neither. And this is quite different than the map I'm going to show you with um, the Cuba and Hispanic, Black clustering. So when thinking about this North Philadelphia context, there was a point on the map that was Taller Puerto Riqueño, which is a Philadelphia community um, education resource center and organization that has um, been around for decades. It's actually the place where they have um, the Arturo Schomburg Symposium, which of course Arturo Schomburg, if not if you're not familiar with Arturo Schomburg, um, he was a Afro Boricua um, scholar, bibliophile, and um, collected the largest uh, library on the African diaspora in the United States, which is in the New York Public Libraries. So Taller Puerto Riqueño does the symposium on Afro-Latinidad and has been doing it for over 20 years. And so this community resource and educational center is central uh, within the uh, Latinx Puerto Rican community. Um, and it's a, it, it shows how it's important to make sure that we map on these resources. Taller Puerto Riqueño wouldn't necessarily be seen on a map. Um, related to issues of educational access and college opportunity. And so in creating this map with the Diet Puerto Riqueño and this Puerto Rican community, I'm adding in um, this context, this local context, which gives uh, more nuance and more possibility to these uh, publicly uh, created, these publicly um, uh, shared data sets like the census. <laughs> 
And so also in North Philadelphia, when we're looking at Afro-Latinx populations, uh, again, that tend to be from the Caribbean, which includes Kuwa, we know that there was a protest in the summer that was in North Philly, um, and we know Afro-Cubans were a part of that uh, as well. And so I think what's really important here is to also document the history of Cuban and Puerto Rican activism in Philadelphia. Uh, it goes back to the independence movements um, of uh, the Cuban Revolutionary Party in the late 1890s. And also um, Arturo Schomburg was a part of the Cuban Revolutionary uh, Independence Party and was Puerto Rican. Uh, and they established a lot of chapters, about six in Philadelphia in the late 1890s and hence created this Latino Latinx community uh, in the 1890s and was situated within uh, two areas and two neighborhoods of North Philly. So Cubans and Puerto Ricans have been active and working together uh, since the 1890s in Philadelphia. And so what we have here is a similar map to the Hispanic Black Puerto Rican map I showed you with the unsupervised clusters, um, which again, I use uh, ArcGIS to do the mapping um, myself and my research team. And what we see here is we actually have four categories of the un unsupervised cluster. And so what the cluster does, it actually looks at the similarities between the groups and clusters them. But here, the, the actual tool created four categories instead of three. And I find this particularly interesting because in having this fourth category of, of only Cuban, it shows that the Cuban population is more dispersed and has some differentiation between the Hispanic Black and Cuban population. But when we look at the Hispanic Black and Cuban population, in comparison to the Hispanic Black and Puerto Rican population, remember the clusterings that were evident in North Philly, when we look at this population, we see that they're actually, their clustering is more dispersed. They're not as connected They're and they extend into Northeast Philadelphia, which means they have different clusterings, different concentrations. They are the, the neighborhoods, Philly neighborhoods at times um, are considered more block oriented than actually neighborhood oriented. So block by block, there may be differences in educational attainment, differences in um, uh, uh, employment opportunity uh, and differences in migration patterns as well. So it's important again, using this GIS tool to explore census data gives us some possibilities as far as thinking about how to understand uh, Puerto Rican and Cuban populations, especially in the Northeast, which is where the largest Afro-Latinx uh, populations tend to reside, are within the North and East areas of the United States. So to conclude, it's important to, to remember one, the history of race making and migration in Afro-Latin America is central to the identities of Afro-Latinx people within the US. Also geography, as you can see, is a major factor in understanding how Afro-Latinx people identify and their educational opportunities and economic opportunities and their social mobility largely. Also important thinking about foreign policy and domestic policy and local resources as they contribute to how residents organize for example, Cubans and Puerto Ricans in North Philly, and also how they work and learn. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to your engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dache. These have been wonderful presentations. We've had interactions in the chat. We also have some questions coming in. If you haven't posed yours yet, feel free to do so in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. And also feel free to engage in the chat with uh, reactions for both, for both presentations. So I'll go ahead and start with uh, some of the questions that we received in the chat. And I'll go ahead and start with you, Michael, this first question. Uh, that perhaps in many ways uh, Amalia can answer as well. 
The question is what role do non-white diasporic peoples from Latin America play in all of this, such as indigenous and black Afro descendants? It's interesting how the early advocacy was on census including Spanish speaking people in the US, which then excludes some indigenous and Afro indigenous people. So issues of representation, the census and sort of uh, roles that, that non-white diasporic folks played in that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a great uh, question. Um, I mean, one, one part of this is uh, the need uh, to do uh, some some additional sort of historical work, right? To uncover uh, some of those vo voices. You know, the, the the historical record is relatively thin, you know, compared to other mm -hmm. sorts of topics. So that period that I described, there's still a lot of work to be done about the actors and organizations and tensions and all of that. So that's one thing that's that's quite important uh, to to keep in mind. Um, certainly for the the advocacy organizations from that period, um, their sense um, repeatedly uh, is that this population was uh, not white, not black, via sort of U.S. racial categories, right, and uh, and, and and embraced um, some notions of mestizaje, even if they were not often explicitly sort of elaborated. Um, and and so that entails, you know, some, uh, you know, it, it entails exclusions of, of of Afro Latinx or Indigenous Latinx from the conversation. Um, but but in the period, there's certainly, you know, one of the points that I want to stress was that there was a, a a pretty strong reaction or resistance to being classified more or less as white um, in this period. So they were trying to carve out some. You know, I guess third space, um, but we know that 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 position comes with its own complications and and, and uh, erasures. And I will just add, thanks, um, Michael, for that. I will just add that in digging up the work on uh, Puerto Ricans in North Philly, it's I would be hard pressed, and I think Michael would agree. It was hard for me to find anything on like Afro Puerto Ricans or anything related to Afro, any Latinx, Latino, Hispanic category in the 60s and 70s and 80s and maybe getting close even to the 90s. So what I've had to do is actually look at images. So I've actually been finding images of North Puerto Ricans. And what you find is that a large portion, I mean, just based on phenotype, which is what we all, how we also kind of ascribe race in the United States, you have a large portion of Afro Puerto Ricans that are part of these populations that were never really counted because there wasn't exactly what Michael's work is about. And so you have to go into the historical record and actually find um, find them and actually visual, you have to see the visual representations, the photographic and the visual data to see the presence of Afro Latinx people in, for example, um, city uprising, city kind of organizing and advocacy uh, and policy work, anything that's like in newspapers, you will see them highly present. I was actually um, very excited to see, you know, their role in like the bilingual movement in North Philly. Um, it, it was very central. Uh, they were very central to that. Absolutely. Thank you both for that. Yes, indeed. I have questions about methods and access and equity and you know, hearing you both speak really about the added labor that goes into documenting these histories, uh, these livelihoods, um, these, you know, roles that different folks have played historically and currently. Um, and so, so I appreciate, you know, that nuance of like having to go and uh, even further, right, and deeper into trying to obtain information um, as best possible. There's a question that is sort of um, was clarified for me in the chat that is specifically for you, Dr. Dache. Do you think that Hispanic Latinx people move away from identifying as Negro or Black the more mixed they feel they are, unlike the historical one drop rule in the US? So that was that's one of the theories because of this history of whitening um, in, in Latin America, you have this push to uh, think about adelantar la raza or mejorar la raza, which is the closer you get to white, 
you know, the better, the better you are as a human being. And so you still have those remnants, um, you know, especially when you think about Dominicans, Guanos. I also think, so I want to say like this, this and in caps, yes, and Afro-Latinos also do not necessarily see themselves, at least based on the data I've collected on Puerto Ricans in North Philly and Afro-Cubans in the U.S. Uh, and Cubans in the U.S., they don't necessarily see themselves reflected in the Black category because they see themselves as different culturally, linguistically, and nationalistically than African-Americans. And so they see the Black box and the fact that it's Black and English, right? So I think there's linguistic differences here as well they don't necessarily see themselves in that category. So they may they may check Hispanic and they may say Hispanic is inclusive of black in their minds thinking about Latin America. Um, I've met some participants in my study that says things like, well, to say that you're Afro-Cuban um, is redundant because Cubans are 70% of African descent. And so there's like this redundancy. It's like saying Afro-Jamaican or Afro-Haitian. Uh, but what happens is in the US, there's this whitening that happens with Cuban Americans, which makes people like me, you know, um, want to claim the Afro, the Afro Cubanness uh, within, you know, living in the United States. But it's complicated, but I do think that there's an and. There's yes, there's anti Blackness. Yes, there's this distancing. But yes, there's also these cultural and nationalistic and linguistic factors. Yes, let me let me follow up on that because I did have a question for you. Um, I, I think there's a, you know, there's something to be said about the significance of naming things as they are. And um, so I'm wondering, as I think about the use of data, particularly demographic statistics uh, that are inherent, there are inherent tensions between invisibility and visibility that are increasing, particularly among vulnerabilized groups such as Afro Latinxes, um, who have high have received right perhaps heightened attention in diversity discourse, yet have been harmed continuously right and, and continue to be targets of harm how do you balance this blurry line in your work of documenting and mapping out uh the experiences of afro latinx's uh, afro, afro latinx communities uh without engaging right um in in having that data available for others to use as harmful tactics so I tend to draw from post-colonial studies kind of epistemology where I use data, both quantitative and qualitative, in a way that one points to domination, right? So using quantitative data to say, like, this is the result of domination. These categories are a result of domination. Um, you know, the social factors are a result of domination. So that's what I, I do to kind of like document and describe. At the same time, I also talk about resistance, right? The other kind of post-colonial prong is what has resistance looked like for this community? And the resistance looks like the construction of the Diet Puerto Rico, for example, in North Philly, right? The fact that Cuban Americans, Afro-Cubans are organizing in North Philly, those are resistance. The fact that they pushed, you know, language policy and they're organizing and they've been organizing and changing the landscape in, in these cities. Um, and so focusing both on how domination functions and at the same time, how resistance has functioned and how they've been able to create space and self-affirm affirm themselves um, in the city and in, in, you know, in the rights to the city, thinking about rights to the city, they've been, they've been doing that, that work. And I want to document both. Um, and I tend to focus more on the resistance, right? Because the qualitative stories show very rich, you know, histories and narratives, um, highly intelligent people that have, you know, theorized their own experiences and what was happening around them. And so it kind of is also a counter to um, the quantitative uh, domination variables or statistics that you, you tend to get um, when you just only focus on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Michael, I have a question for you. I know that in your book, um, you speak about temporality in addition to quantification and emotions. Um, and you mentioned that it's key in your ther theoretical framing of population politics. And I'm struck by your attention on quote unquote, the sociology of the future, uh, this upcoming, or I guess more emergent or recent uh, subfield in your area that uh, not as, or isn't an intangible speculation, but rather, quote, 
a growing body of work that coincides with work on expectation, anticipation, preparedness, temporal multiplicity, and even speed. How do you make sense of this in relation to frequent, frequent comments uh, that I feel we hear a lot about in terms of we are living in this moment? Uh, and you mentioned, I know, in this moment in the book as well, um, that I feel has increased greatly since the Trump administration, part of the administration that you touch on in your book. This moment to me seems very much in, but not solely of the present. And so I was wondering uh, if you had thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great and um, you know complicated question about you know <clears throat> like how we how we feel time, you know whether we feel ourselves as like heading towards some future or we feel boggled down in the present or we feel ourselves sort of slipping into the past um, and you know the, the 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 book is 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 sort of emphasizing the kind of like political struggles that that inform how we feel about time and temporality and what kind of uh, temporal rhetoric is circulating at a particular moment. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think certainly, you know, like in the, the, the book covers, uh, uh, you know, from, let's say from the 2010 census to up into the Trump administration, if you look at Latino advocacy organization and like public discourse um, about the, about ethno-racial demographics in the country, right? There's like a sense that there's like rapid sort of movement towards the future. So there's a ton of future talk. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, Trump is elected and many people are surprised by that, even though the writing is on the wall in many respects. And then people feel like it's about, it's about the present, you know? Um, and so there has definitely over the past uh, several years, been a, a, a sort of shift from a very strong, v rather utopian, hyper-optimistic, very post-racial uh, future discourse of which Latino advocacy groups have participated in and tried to like leverage and a kind of recognition of, of sort of, um, you know, current white supremacist sort of politics and white stoked fear and all of those things which demand attention in the present, you know? So the future seems, the future that people were talking about a few years ago seems further away today than it did then, you know, as a result of the kind of like political discourse and politics that are happening uh, today. Thank you. We have several questions and we're almost out of time. Let me ask you a question that we've received in the chat about your um, your thoughts, both of your thoughts about the proposal to collapse the Latino ethnicity question with the race question on the census. Does it inevitably lead to invisibilizing Afro-Latinxes as we've been talking about? I mean, I think the census is the beginning, right? We've always had to contend with what the census does or does not do. And so I think that's why it's important to, to ask more questions and to know that it's incomplete, right? We can't just base things on these statistics, as I mentioned before, thinking about issues of resistance, qualitative data, um, the actual human experiences and stories of Afro-Linux people are as important um, because it's not just a quantifiable, these are not just quantifiable social problems. These are also qualitative uh, problems um, and issues having to do with human experience. And so, it's not going to be the end all uh, be all, uh, but I do think there should be ways where we can slice up these numbers and uh, that can reflect more um, the diversity of, of the Latinx group and of the black group as well when thinking about Afro Latinidad. Yeah, I mean, uh, to echo that, I mean, I think I think the, the, the key point that Dr. Lache said, and I think we need to keep repeating, is the census data and quantitative data is not the be all end all of, of anything, right? It's always gonna be incomplete and shaped by the political conditions of the moment. There's a lot of debate about the census um, and what, what's gonna happen, whether the Biden administration will move to collapse the questions which have been proposed prior to the 2020 census. Uh, I think there's some merit to the, to the collapsing but there's also serious questions and debates to be had about that process. And also, again, the limitations of whichever, the current scheme and what, what's being proposed don't address 
some of the, the sort of vital needs that we have to track inequalities, let's say via you know phenotype and, and things like that, that's not captured in either of those frameworks. Uh, one, one issue that it does seem to, uh, based on the, the, the data, is it lowers the number of, you know, right now the, the second largest um, racial group is other race in the U.S., according to the U.S. Uh, you know, census. And so collapsing those seems to decrease that, but it doesn't, it doesn't address everything. And so we have to sort of see how we move forward, perhaps with some things, but also address what are structural limitations to census classification uh, as currently set up in the Census Bureau. And I'll add one more thing to that. In thinking about um, IPEDS data, so institutional post-secondary education data sets, what the census has at least done well and has improved on is being able to check both the Hispanic Latin category and the racial category. So you can understand and I could actually use and, and create these variables of Hispanic Black. We can't do that with iPads data. So we have to start pushing other kind of data sources, uh, especially government educational data sources um, to kind of at least move to the census model. <laughs> it's like moving everyone just a little bit more to um, you know to diversifying and uh, disaggregating their their data sets. Thank you. So many excellent questions. Apologies for not being able to get to all of them. Questions about Black Lives Matter statements in relation to support for Cubans, Afro Cubans, the census in Mexico. Um, so many wonderful questions. Again, apologies for not being able to get to all of them. This has been an excellent start to the day. Thank you again, Dr. Dach and Dr. Rodriguez Muñiz, to our audience the year of data and society as our sponsor, especially Dr. Nora Madden and her team and everyone who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes, Matthew and also helping us with tech. Uh, for audience members, remember that you can purchase Michael's book, Figures of the Future, Latino Civil Rights and the Politics of Demographic Change with a 30% discount by entering MRM30 at checkout until November 30th. You can also find Amalia's book. We'll uh, share again those those links in the chat. And lastly, please remember to check out the rest of the Latinx Connect Conference today and tomorrow. As my colleague Michelle Reed Vasquez mentioned yesterday, there is something for everyone. Thanks for joining and have a great day.